All right. So those are the relatively cognitive needs that Fisk identified. And then she identified two relative effective or what we would consider in, in, in a lot of uh, terminology are emotional needs uh, to seek out belonging and stable relationships. One is self-enhancement, and that is basically to the need to feel some that, that we're basically worthy and improvable. And so we do often seek out uh, what the opinions of others are about maybe not even necessarily something that deals with us, but something close to us, such as our occupation, our education, our culture, our, our way of living. And we might not even make it a reference to who we are, but we want to know what people think about that, well, they, they view, how they view us as either an individual or a member of a group of individuals. Um, and, you know, when we get to, and I'll admit, when we get to uh, discrimination, bias, and prejudice, this is one of the most basic needs that, that tends to be denied to individuals who are of a a minority or fringe group. This is the place that is most often attacked. Why? Because this has such a, a repressive effect when it isn't um, provided. Uh, this is what creates people um, uh, to be stuck in uh, uh, their current situation. Uh, this is what creates situations in which we don't try to improve ourselves. So a dominant culture, a dominant group will often hit this first because they know it has such a repressive um, uh, 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 effect on that group of individuals. On the positive end, we know that self-enhancement really has uh, lots of good psychological benefits. So within the area of education, uh, there's been a lot of literature published over the last several years reg regarding what's called the growth mindset. Now, this, this idea goes back uh, a, a few decades here in the field of psychology. But what growth mindset is, is when you're approaching someone you focus not necessarily on their roadblocks, not necessarily on their negative attributes, but you focus on their, po their positive aspects, what they do good at. And you work on building those. And what we have found is that through building those, those roadblocks, those negative things that are affecting the person's performance tend to all of a sudden for the individual start to have solutions. Uh, and this is believed to be because of the effect that uh, focusing on the, the, the strengths and the quality of the person has on the brain itself. When you do do that, it actually open, it opens up the dopamine channels in the brain and by opening up the dopamine channels, that's where we are the most creative. That's when we're most able to do the, our best problem solving. That's when we learn better. But when we focus on the negative qualities of people, it closes those dopamine channels and it actually affects the serotonin system, which is the emotionally driven system. And what we have come to learn about the serotonin system is it kind of closes those channels, closes our ability to grow and develop and, and to, to really become uh, you know, open to solutions. Uh, it is a protective system in a sense to try and maintain where we're at right now, but it prohibits us from doing any more growth in our life. So self-enhancement is one of those things that we seek through belonging. Um, and later in the uh, uh, class, when we talk about, for example, 
toxic relationships versus positive relationships. We'll see how this plays out because in toxic relationships, the goal of the person who is toxic is to always push that person down until they, they, they're unable to live without that individual. And in a sense, it's because they blocked that person's ability to see beyond their current situation. So we'll get in more into that uh, when we move into, uh, you know, things like intimate relationships and friendships and, 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 and family systems. And we'll talk about that when we get to toxicity in those types of relationships. The last effective need is trusting. Now, I should say for Fisk, uh, trusting isn't what we commonly think of trusting. You know, one of the common definitions of trusting is that there's a reciprocal relationship that uh, we know that if, if I need help, you will always show up. And if you need help, I'll always show up. And we have this emotional kind of understanding for each other. For Fisk on the broader level, now don't get me wrong, that version of trust is important, especially in parent-child relationships, in uh, 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 intimate partner relationships. But for Fisk on the broader level, trust is defined as the need to view others as basically benign or uh, benign, it means that it's, it's non-threatening. It's, 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 if you think about uh, someone who has a tumor um, and they have it tested and it'll come back either benign or manig ma manigland. Okay, benign means that it's, just, it, it's not a risk to the individual where, you know, man, man, I can't say it, manigland ah, uh, means that it's probably something cancerous and needs to be further investigated. Fisk suggested this thing as well. And, you know, and again, we can look at social behavior to look at this. Uh, we, we, when we video record people going into a group of other unknown individuals, there's something interesting that happens. The person will walk into the room and they will scan the room. They will look back and forth. And even though they don't know anybody in the room, they will instantly gravitate towards individuals who are close to their gender, close to their age, close, close to their ethnicity, close to, and, and interestingly, in some sound experiments, they will even gravitate close to individuals who sound like them or sound like their parents and will instantly gravitate towards those individuals. And we will avoid people who are distanced to that, okay? That is what this effective need is about, that we need to, one, be with people who we see as benign, and avoid people who we see as risk takers. And so then the question becomes, well, how do people end up in uh, bad relationships or bad uh, situations? And that goes back to development in childhood and the way we define and use language and connect that with emotions. And I'll give a, a really good example, um, working with a uh, individuals uh, when I did clinical work who were constantly getting in and out of violent relationships, and they just couldn't get in and out of those relationships. Not all, but the majority of them, if we went back into their childhood, they had uh, parents who who also didn't give them the proper definition of what love and caring and stability meant. And let me give you this, the, this scenario. So we know that uh, across cultures, um, that in every culture that we've ever studied, 
there is a notion of mother and there is a notion of father. And in almost every culture we've studied, the mother is usually the nurturing one, the caring one, the reciprocal one that provides what we would define as love, okay? And the father also provides, uh, uh, so mom tends to be that unconditional kind of source of caring from a uh, inherited perspective. And I wanna make that clear. The father we've recognized is that one who provides that conditional love that uh, if you perform a certain way, I will give you this. If you perform a certain way, I will, I'll give you this. Now, in modern terms, we do have to recognize that uh, these things tend to be blended with single family homes and that. But let's go with that, that this basic idea that what, and, and we'll go down the mother's line, is what mother represents is this concept of love. Whether we have a term for it or not, when we term love as far as caring, um, unconditional support, uh, and all of those things, okay? And then we, we have to complicate things with language and with meaning. And so uh, when I give a, a, a lecture on, on child development, when it comes to these kinds of conversations, even nonverbal infants, the first thing we have to recognize is that our first language is emotions, okay? Indeed, emotions are such a refined language that nonverbal infants are much more statistically savvy than adults are. Uh, based on the emotions the infant feels, they can actually predict behavior better than adults. And that's our first language, okay? And so, you know, a lot of parents don't realize this. Uh, I'll, I'll give this example of, of, of kind of two very binary uh, parents, caregivers. Uh, in one situation, the, the, the uh, infant experiences, the infant cries, mom shows up, uh, feeds the baby. Let's say in this situation, the baby looks at mom, the mom looks at the baby, they have this moment. We call this the infant parent dance, okay? Where there's this need that is satisfied and then there's this reciprocal thank you. So in this first situation, baby cries, mom shows up, feeds. Baby cries, mom shows up, changes the baby. Baby cries, mom shows up. And they're having this constant exchange of uh, need, need fulfillment, and this reciprocal thing going on. Well, let's look at the other situation. And I want you to all kind of put yourself not on the verbal level, but the emotional level. So don't necessarily think about the words I'm saying, but in the response emotionally and physically it creates. So baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, no Door opens loudly. Caregiver goes, what do you need now? I'm busy. You're bothering me. What do you possibly need? All right. I hope I didn't put anybody in a tizzy. My dog's walking to the back room. But I'm hoping uh, uh, everyone felt the emotional tone. Infants know that emotional tone and they know the meaning of it, okay? And so we have mother figure, and then we get into the verbal part where mom says, I love you, but then she slaps the child, she beats the child, she isolates the child, she ignores the child. This is an extreme example. Um, but then she comes back when the child, I love you, 
You're all mine. I, all I care about you. Okay. In this situation, I want you to think emotionally and developmentally, what is this child learning? What the child is learning is that love does not represent nurturing, caring, feelings of reciprocation. What the child is learning on a cognitive emotional level is love means chaos. Love means anger. Love means inconsistency, okay? And so in our verbal language, what happens to many of these children who then become adults and end up in these chronically bad relationships is that their definition of love, while cognitively it's supposed to be about caring and emotions, what they're seeking out effectively is the chaos and the hurt and the pain because that's what's familiar to them and that's what's predictable to them. And so when they do meet, for example, later in life, that romantic relationship where the man is stable, he provides for the effective good feelings for the individual, that man becomes unattractive becomes dangerous because the behavior that he is admitting is not predictable for that child or for that adult, I should say at this time, excuse me. And so they'll avoid not necessarily uh, em cognitively, but emotionally, they will avoid those relationships and seek those relationships that are predictable to them, okay? Now, this isn't everybody who ends up in constant toxic relationships. There's always variability to this, but that is the common pattern we see. So when we look at this issue of trust, we need to realize about how a person through their lifetime has defined what someone who is benign is what someone who is non-harmful is. And it's usually that person that we, when we go back to understanding and control on this level, and that's why we call these relative, that we see that we've learned to be benign. And sometimes in some situations, that's not necessarily the good feelings of trust, okay? All right. I'm going to kind of pause here and ask, does anybody have any questions about these four basic needs for belonging? No questions. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Keisha. Yeah, I'm good. No questions here. All right, thanks, Frank. No questions. All right, thanks, Marissa. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. So we'll come back to these four basic concepts as we're studying broader sociological concepts. We'll come back to these when we're talking about prejudice, discrimination. We'll talk about this when we get to healthy relationships. We'll talk about this when we get to culture as well. So kind of keep these kind of four motives in mind. All right, so terminology that, that, that I just wanna, so, so that when we're having these conversations, you understand kind of the definition that is being used. So the first one is the definition of power. The definition of power that we'll use through this class is the, the position of authority, influence, and certain skills one has over others, okay? And there's kind of, uh, according to sociology, there's kind of five sources of power, okay? The first one is legitimate power, and this is also known as positional power. So legitimate power would be, for example, a law enforcement officer, a probation officer, a judge, 
um, a lawmaker, someone vote in, in our country, someone voted into a certain position that we provide some type of power. If we're employed into an organization, a CEO, for example, a corporate executive officer, or a supervisor because of their job description have some type of power over us or have some type of power, okay? That's legitimate power. And then we have expert power. And this is a power given to people because they have some certain type of knowledge. Um, uh, so we can think of, we listen to experts when we're listening to uh, uh, a lecture on physics, for example. Um, uh, my son is, is working on his, his PhD in physics. I don't understand most conversations we have. So I assume he knows what he's talking about and I don't question it. <laughs> uh, part of that is because I just don't understand what he's saying, but I've given him that authority, that power to be the expert in that area and, 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 and try to assume that that's the understanding. Okay, if you think about the awkward relationship we have in education, we give professors both legitimate power because I have the ability to fail or pass you, and that power is given to me by the college or university and accrediting agencies that uh, uh, provide that. Uh, but then we also have the assumption of expert power that uh, I come because of my educational experience and, and all of those things to provide some type of knowledge uh, that can't be questioned, okay? And, and so there is that assumption, um, you know, when we, when we interview students about that, that, that are falling behind and stuff, and we ask, um, you know, why didn't you use that instructor's office hour or go talk to the instructor? Um, the most common response we get from students, not all students, but from most students, is that they were intimidated by the instructor because of this notion that there's some type of special expert in, in what they're doing. And so they give them a certain amount of power over them uh, that, 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 then they, that the intimidation to go talk to them is, is there. Um, in a lot of ways, that's why I'm, I, 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 I like t t teaching sociology and psychology because there's so many things we don't know. I would never claim that I'm an expert. So um, <laughs> that's just where I am on that, that level. On the third level, we have cohesive power. So we can, uh, on the broader culture level, we can think of things like dictatorships uh, where, where there's a government who is who is forcing the people into submission. Um, we can also think of legitimate powers that use this. So we can look at you know, excessive force of law enforcement officers where they have a legitimate power, but they use that power in a cohesive manner, which creates a lot of fear among the public about what they would do um, in, in life. We can think of uh, domestic abusers in this sense um and the like okay we also have referent power okay and the best way to explain referent power is power given to people because they tend to be a member of a certain group okay so we can think about in our culture you know we think about the power levels based on race and, and the, 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 the authority that is given to, for example, white people over black people and that they should feel subservient in a lot of ways to that white power. Um, and that's just one example. We can look at other ones that have class systems. We give a lot of referent power in the United States to people who are rich. Uh, that, that's not to be rich, you don't have to have any expertise. You don't even really need to have some type of legitimate type of thing. And a lot of times you don't even need cohesion to become rich in the United States. A lot of times you just have to be in the right place at the right time in the right situation. But we give referent power to uh, a lot of wealthy people. Uh, we can think of celebrity 
as having referent power. Um, I think about, uh, you know, how much power a famous person has, even though they've probably never taken a class on it, they've never had a uh, personal experience with it, but they will go to Congress and they will be listened to, for example, or they could put something uh, socially provocative on social media and all of a sudden everyone will go towards that uh, uh, system of thought. It's not that they have any type of legitimate power. A lot of times they don't even have expert power, but they have referent power because of their status as a celebrity. Okay. And then we have reward power, which is power given to someone because they've done something extraordinarily good or even bad. So examples of reward power is we give a lot of authority to, for example, um, uh, Martin Luther King. Um, we give reward power to people like uh, Adolf Hitler. Um, even though you would think that's coercive power, which it was at the time he took power, but the people who still find him legitimate are because they're rewarding him for the things that he did. Remember, reward doesn't always have to be positive. A reward can also be negative. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, reward power is neither legitimate nor expert. Uh, if we look at John F. Kennedy, um, now don't get me wrong, I love uh, this gentleman. He had a lot of good ideas about how to make the United States a better place. But if you really look at John F. Kennedy's history, he had a lot of good ideas, but he was never able to implement them because he was assassinated. So a lot of the good things we reward JFK for doing and being, he never actually ac accomplished. And so uh, a lot of people emulate John F. Kennedy. I do as well because of his ideas. But what we need to realize is that's a form of reward power because we're rewarding him for his ideas, but his ideas were never actually implemented because of his untimely assassination. So those are some examples of the different powers we give people. Um, and sometimes they're legitimate, sometimes they're non-legitimate. And the reason why I want everybody to know these five sources of power is that sometimes we kind of clump these all together and we assume that a celebrity has the same abilities as an expert who has the same abilities as someone who has legitimate voted in authority. And we think that those legitimate individuals have the same power as an expert and the same power as someone who is a celebrity. But the thing I want us to recognize in this class is that while as a social uh, system, we give all of these sources of power equal weight. We need to understand where they're coming from to become a more informed and, and conscious uh, society and conscious individuals, okay? And so some other terminology, just to get out of the way, when we talk about power differentials, we talk about the unequal distribution about material phenomenon. So we talk about how uh, within systems, uh, people who have uh, people of wealth often tend to have more, even though they may not uh, be the producers for that society. So when we look at the difference between the ruling classes of a society or the wealthy classes of the society, um, they're not usually the ones who are distributing or making the materials, the food, the, the resources for the, the earth or for people, I should say, not the earth, for people to be distributed. They often are the ones who end up with a power because they, they're the ones that have taken 
the, 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 that type of authority from us or from equal distribution, okay? Dialectical materialism <laughs> is the ongoing debate about material pheno phenomenon. So this is how we talk socially about how we should distribute uh, the, the resources we have in the world. And, you know, if we think about this, this comes down to the, some debates such as capitalism versus socialism. And if you think about a capitalist, they will always talk negatively about a socialist. And a socialist will always talk negatively about a capitalist. But if we look at the pure definitions of both, it's all about the distribution of power and the distribution of resources. From the socialist perspective, it states that we should work towards what's called an egalitarian system where everybody has equal distribution of resources within a social system. If we think about capitalism, what it states is that through competition, this creates equality and that those have are the ones who have taken advantage and worked towards it. And those who haven't are the ones that don't. But distribution is equalized in capitalism through competition. So that is what dialectical materialism is. It's this constant conversation and debate about how resources or materials should be distributed. Natural powers and needs are the capability and the needs that humans share with other animals. So when we talk about natural power, this is the, the, the things we share with the other species that exist on this earth. And what are some things that we share uh, with other species, especially, and this is just an example, there's several, uh, we don't control the weather. Uh, well, unless we start talking about uh, global warming and those types of things. Um, but um, we don't control what happens with a hurricane. Our homes are uh, equally destructible as a other species that are in the path of that hurricane or that tornado or that. And so that's just an example of natural powers. Uh, we are limited by our reproductive abilities. We're limited by uh, the areas of the earth that we can exist on or we can survive on without having outside resources. So those are that's what when we consider natural powers, it's the ones we share with other species and other animals. When we talk about species powers and needs, and that's the cap capabilities and needs that are specific to a given species. And the one that I always like to bring up is, and I bring this up time and time and again in sociology, is that, for example, humans are social connect, have a social connection needs. And that's what makes us a successful species. However, we have other species that are more isolated. We can think about, for example, wolves as an example, who are, tend to be very solitary animals. And they are successful in their uh, in their ways through the power that they have through being isolated animals. When we talk, this terminology stuff, I swear, species being is a state of being fully maximized with all natural and species power. So this is when we are both connected with what we have with the other species that we exist with and with our own unique species. So this is, this is the individual, and I'll, I'll just bring this up. This is the individual who can go into nature and understand the natural processes that are there, but also connect themselves with their human nature or their humanness, okay? And this is very a sociological term because not a lo lot of sociologists like the idea of capitalism, and I'm going to put this out there, but distortion, when we talk about distortion, this is what we call the consequences of capitalism. 
uh, in that in any capitalistic system, we will find that there will be always a power differential between those who have and that those who don't have. In fact, when the United States became almost a purist capitalist nation, um, a lot of sociologists and even a lot of economists say that's what predicted the Great Depression. Um, and then we had to put social systems into place and get away from pure capitalism in order to stabilize uh, the nation here in the United States. So distortion is kind of that consequences of capitalism where there will always be people who will try to maintain all of the resources, in this case, you know, financial resources and whatnot, and disperse themselves from those who don't have those, those privileges. But the other distortion of capitalism is this notion that everybody has the ability to uh, become wealthy or, or maintain resources if they just apply themselves. Um, and we'll look at kind of the sociological consequences of that and how that, that creates a kind of a, almost a, a, a non-utopic society, okay? Other terminology that we'll use throughout this class is one is alienation. All right, this is an interesting word, odd. Form odd distortion caused by capitalism. Okay, so alienation. Again, this is an argument uh, going kind of uh, with pure capitalism in which what it creates is a disconnect between the individual and their natural humanness or their natural uh, connection with other species. Okay, and so that's kind of the term for alienation. False consciousness is the failure to recognize one's place in the social hierarchy because one alluded to believe they are in control of one's choices. This really comes from especially societies who are individualistic, where the belief in individualism is one's success and failures are because of the individual and not because of anything else, such as resources in the world, other people, social systems. And this false consciousness is the idea that um, I am where I am because uh, I am responsible for my own successes, for my own failures, and therefore this is my social position. And in some cases, it can create a false sense of where they are in the social system. In other cases, it can hold people where they're at and hold them in that social system. And then social class is a place one occupies in the social hierarchy. And when it comes to social class, we can generalize them in about three categories. One has to do with wealth and power, where we have upper classes that own and control the means of production. So, you know, here in the United States, we've always heard about the 1% or the 5%. And literally here in the United States, the majority of wealth is concentrated in the 1% of people in the United States and the rest is distributed to the rest of us. So this is one category of social class and we're seeing the, 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 the distance between those becoming larger and larger. We also have the notion of middle class uh, that we consider professional workers, working class and low level managers. Uh, so this is kind of the mid-level people. Um, and then we have the third class, which is a lower class who rely on low paying wages, jobs for their livelihood. Okay, and, and there's some reasons uh, both uh, socially and culturally and whatnot that these systems are created. For example, let's take the mid-level to third-level individuals. So a, a middle-class person, uh, which at the time of this study was defined as someone making $50,000 a year or more, um, and, and at that time, that was uh, when a person making $50,000 could maintain a home, 
a family, you know, all of those types of things. Uh, it was found that a person making $50,000 or more relied on at least seven lower class people to maintain their lifestyle. What do I mean by that? If you think about going to the gas station, you're relying on one person there. If you're going to the grocery store, you're relying on one person there. If you go to another place, you're and so it's it's predicted that for every one middle class person, there is at least seven lower class people who are needed to maintain that lifestyle. When we go to the connection between one, two, and three for a very wealthy person, the number goes to a hundred plus people who are needed to maintain their livelihood. And when we talk not only about their personal livelihood, but their wealth, we're talking about one to every 10 to 20,000 people are necessary to maintain their wealth. So these systems are, are based upon the money systems that we have and the need for people below that level to maintain that lifestyle that that person has. All right, so I just want to stop really quick. I know this is a lot of terminology. This isn't the most exciting part of, of, of talking about sociology, but does anybody have any questions about power, about power differential, dialectical materialism, species being distortion, or alienation, false consciousness, and social class? Does anybody have any questions at this moment? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No questions. No questions. Questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. And so, two other terminologies. I think I'm hoping this is the last one. Oh no, it's not. Okay. Uh, two other type of terminologies that will come across commonly in this course is what is called fetishism of commodities. And this is the love things that, the love for things that bring money that we can buy and eventually leading to the love for money itself. So this is the notion of once I have a little, I want more. Um, and when we see this, you know, we think about um, power within that money has over individuals. So a lot of people coming out of poverty or coming out of the middle class go, you know what, once I reach $100,000, 100,000 a year or $200,000 a year, I will be satisfied. Uh, but what we find is that when people get to that 100 to $200,000, they want even more. They want that 400 to 600,000. When they get to that, they want the 800 to 900,000. And, and this is a common theme that we see when people reach a certain level that they thought they would be satisfied with. But then once that is met, they want even more. And this brings up something that is called the happiness curve. When we look at studies of happiness and its, uh, its relation to money, we find that there is a number which in the United States is $75,000 a year. So I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna try and draw it, sorry. And I'm gonna put this line right here because what we find with happiness, so happiness is on this axis, income, we'll put a less sign, whoops, whoops. We'll put a less sign on here and we'll put a more sign above 75,000. Is what we find with happiness is that it's a U curve distribution to where it goes like this. That once we get to 75,000 based on income, no other variables, just income. And when we control for other variables, from an income perspective, people are the most happiest 
at about $75,000 a year in the United States. You go below that or you go above that and happiness goes down based on income. There's a lot of other variables that influence um, happiness. And we have to ask why? Well, we know that below 75,000, people are concerned about providing for their family. They're focused on working to try and maintain their family. They're worried about when their next meal is gonna come. They, this is the class that most likely is living from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck in order to maintain their family. When we get about above $75,000, parents lose the ability to say no to their kids. This is an example. If you think about being below $75,000, you teach your kids, hey, if you want this, you've got to earn it because I, I can't afford it there. And you can show them on your checkbook or your bank account and say, listen, we've got to work for these things. When we start to get above 75,000, that excuse is no longer there. That, that, that ability to negotiate with our children, with our social systems is no longer there. So in both of these situations, we're constantly looking for more and more resources, more and more power in order to maintain our livelihood, in order to maintain the expectations of our social system, including our children, our partners, and our family. And it's equal on both sides when it comes to the terminology of happiness. And this is what kind of is the fetishism of commodities, that as we get more, we want even more. And that want doesn't necessarily become because of selfishness, it becomes because of the demands that are put on us, okay? The other term that we need to talk about is what's called class consciousness. Class consciousness is the realization that one class is an exploited class. So this is when we come to the realization that, you know, uh, um, maybe in our occupation, we need to labor, do labors, uh, labor um, laws or labor, labor rules, excuse me. Uh, we need to uh, lobby to the government to do labor laws uh, because our, our, our people are exploited for who we are. Now, those are just some examples, but there's other levels of exploitation that we can base on class. Um, and so that's what class consciousness is. So when we talk about class, class consciousness, it's realizing where you are in the class system whether it be based on economics or here in the United States, especially it's based on race and skin of color, um, that uh, when we become class conscientious, it come, it, it, it's us realizing where we are in these systems and how we are being exploited because we're a member of that system, okay? All right, I think that is the terminology part um, so does anybody have any questions about fetishism of commodities or class consciousness? I'm good. All right. All right. Very interesting. It, it is. It's interesting stuff. Okay. Thank you, Marissa. Okay. All right, let's talk about what I want to spend the next few minutes uh, uh, going over is some variations of, of one of the, uh, the, the, the theories we went over that really drive a lot of, um, of, of, of sociological inquiry and, and will drive a lot of what we talk about. So I want to return to conflicts uh, theory. Uh, and conflict theory, if you remember when we discussed it, is starts with the knowledge that we live in a world with limited resources, 
And so that in of itself is going to create competition for those resources and then the exploitation for those resources, okay? And two kind of theories that I want to talk about is uh, feminist and what is called critical theory, and one is crisis theory. Now, feminist and crit critical theory is usually used when we're talking about in uh, genders, issues of gender, where there's a prominent cause for social wrongs due to one gender over another. So we can think about things like domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. And so I'm going to say this right out from the, 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 the base uh, that, okay, because I usually get an email about this. Uh, Dr. Peterson, you don't realize that there's men who suffer from domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. I'm not going to disagree with that. But when we look at it statistically, and even when we correct for some of our errors and reporting and whatnot, the majority of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse occurs to women. Um, and when I'm talking about child abuse, uh, I'm not talking about, um, uh, um, uh, uh, what is the term I'm looking for? Um, neglect, okay? Neglect, we know, can happen to any gender. Uh, but when I'm talking about child abuse, I'm talking about things like physical and sexual abuse, which even though uh, a lot of uh, people have argued a lot of physical abuse among children happens equally among girls and boys, uh, the research we show is that it still disproportionately occurs among girls. And the other thing I want to say is this does not deny the experience of boys and men who experience these types of violence and this type of abuse. We have to recognize that it can occur to another gender. But even when we take uh, domestic violence and sexual assault and physical and sexual abuse of children, it always has a male flavor to it. And what I mean by that is when we look at domestic violence, women against men, it still has that same patriarchal, male-oriented domination, uh, uh, circle of abuse dynamic. There's not a unique dynamic that is not male-oriented. Okay, and I can bring up sexual assault um, as well. Um, you know, when, when we talk about, is it possible for a male to be sexually assaulted by a female? We know it's possible for a male to male for that to occur and we can't deny that. Um, but sexual assault from a female to a male, is that possible? The answer to that is yes if there is a male influence. And so I'll talk about when I, when I worked in the female prison system, I was employed there to work with what was called the worst of the worst. So the people who were assigned to me as a clinician were the people who were put in there for, for murder, for sexual assault, the people, the, the females that were on death row, um, I mean, they were they they would be considered very awful people, okay. But the interesting thing is, if we look at their crimes, even in the situation of murder, they always were influenced by some type of male influence. And so, I am going to give a trigger warning for this example, okay. If my example becomes too intense, uh, please pause. Uh, the recording, uh, uh, go ahead and mute it. Um, and then when you see me put a little check mark by feminist and critical theory, go ahead and unmute it. If you do trigger to this story and, and you can't handle it, please get a hold of me after class or through Canvas, please contact Al Alberta Espinoza, uh, who is our, who is our uh, college counselor for assistance. So Please, if you start to feel heavy emotions about this and start triggering to it, 
please mute. And if we, if you've let it go too long, please contact me after class or, or, or a counselor in college. So uh, this is the most common story that I heard among females who, who caused sexual assault to females or males. Okay. And if you want to know, can a male be sexually assaulted by a female? I will tell you that uh, the inmates I worked with has said, yes, all you have to do is stick about an eight inch uh, uh, stick up their uh, uh, backside and um, uh, stimulate the prostate, which will uh, create an uncontrollable erection in the male. So there is that. So, so if you don't think a male can be not be sexually assaulted, even if they're not willing or they can't be aroused, they can be. Uh, but in this situation, when we come to critical theory and feminist theory dealing with gender issues, the most common theory I heard uh, from, from female inmates that were in there because they were considered uh, sexual offenders and they were considered sexual offenders to the point that they could not be integrated back into society. So they were held there for a long period of time. I will tell you one story of an individual who has allowed me to tell this story. It started with her and it did start with her uh, being addicted to methamphetamine. And uh, because of her methamphetamine use, she couldn't hold a job. She couldn't uh, maintain her addiction. And so she went to her, her um, um, drug dealer and say, what can I do? What can I do to, 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 to uh, get you to uh, give me my drug? And this is a thing. If you remember last week, uh, we, lo we watched that uh, show from um, uh, Dr. Zimbardo about uh, in being enticed into evil. And he stated, all evil starts with 15 volts. Okay. This is how this most commonly starts is with that 15 volts. In that the, 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 the drug abuser said, well, send me a picture of your daughter, clothed, unclothed, whatever. Send me a picture of your daughter. So she did, 15 volts. The next time down the road, she wanted uh, um, her needed a fix on her addiction. He would say, well, send me a picture without her shirt on, without her pants on, without her panties on. Next time, bring her to me and let me spend some time with her. And, and usually that first time was very um, um, obiquitous. It didn't include anything. But then it was, next time, I want you to allow me to touch her. Next time, I want you to have her take her shirt off. And so he went through this progression from 15 volts to 350 volts in that slow, methodical way. And then when he got to 350 volts, he's like, well, I want to spend the night with her. And then the next time at 340 volts, I want you to spend the night with me and your daughter. And then at 360 something volts, he said, I want you to be with her while I watch. And the progression went on and on and on. And what happened with this person and a lot of the individuals that I worked with is eventually, uh, she started to abuse not only her daughter, but her daughter's friends in the absence of that male influence. But it all began with that 15 volts, and it built up to that. And it always started with that male influence and built up to that. And so even when, when we talk about feminist and critical theory, we're not downing another gender. We're saying there are things that a gender can put in place in a society that can influence the behavior of that other gender, that can repress them, that could have them do things that they normally would not do. And that's what feminist and critical theory is about, is the recognition that there are, that, that, that power can be based on gender now, critical theory takes it a step further. Critical theory goes beyond gender, and it goes specifically here in the United States to race. And so uh, it takes into the power differentials that occur 
based on race. And I'll give a good, good example of this race-based and we'll talk about financial crimes, okay? So a male and a female uh, steal from their employer uh, and, and the employer catches them and puts them in the legal system. The probable outcome for the male is probation. The probable outcome for the female is five or more years in prison, okay? That's probability. Now there's always variation in these. So that's gender-based. Same crime, different punishment. Then let's take it a step further. Let's put race into the, to the mix. And the most common ones that are, are, are studied in the United States is a difference between white and black people in the United States. We take the male part of that. Overall, males are likely to get probation. Black males are more likely to get five years plus. White females are more likely to get three to five years or more. Black females are more likely to get uh, six to eight plus years in, in prison. Again, same crime, difference in gender, difference in the punishment based on gender, and difference in punishment based on race. And this is what critical theory tries to uh, 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 bring light to and to bring to, to, to our consciousness is that a lot of things within society are really controlled by who we are, gender, and what we are, ethnicity and race, okay? So that's feminist and critical theories and they're two subversion of conflict theory. Crisis theory usually used when working with individuals who are in crisis and experience severe depletion and personal power called victimization. Crisis theory attempts to explain. So feminist and critical theory work on the gender race level. Crisis theory works on the, what we would call the economic level, the power level to get resources to take care of my family um, or to take care of myself as, as, as the idea comes. Um, and it uh, uh, states that when we experience a depletion, especially a severe depletion of personal power, then that creates a situation in which that person or that group of people can be taken advantage of can be exploited, as you would say. So we can look at exploitation of children, for example. We can take uh, exploitation of, for example, women. We can take exploitation of the working class or the poor working class and how we've used them to create uh, wealth. Why? Because of this depletion in some personal power that they come to accept their position and there's no way out of it. Okay, so we're, what's next? What I'm gonna argue for right now is I wanna get more into the feminist and critical theory area um, and more into conflict theory. So if you don't mind, what I think we should do is we should take a 10 minute break at 6.58 right now. So let's take a quick 10 minute break and we'll come back at 7.10. So, um, um, uh, I'll pause our recording. Women much more successful than men. And I, and I think I might have mentioned this in this class before, where we're recognizing that, uh, that uh, well, I can, I, I'll give you a developmental example. Um, and if I mentioned this in the class before, stop me. So I, I'm not repeating something that we've already talked about. But I, I believe that, uh, you know, when we look at development of, of uh, young people and we look at on average, again, there's variation in this and there's individual differences. But on average, when we look at when can a person 
today leave their family and be independent on their own, take care of their own bills, take care of their own rent, all of those kinds of things, okay? And we look at national averages. Here in the United States, the national average is 27 years of age. Now, again, if we compare that to decades past, if we look even back into the 1990s, it was 18, 19, and then we get into the early 2000s, and it ended up being 23, 24, and then today, the average age is 27, okay? However, again, I'm going to go back to the issue of gender. Um, while we live in a, 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 a patriarchal dominant society, and this is where I kind of want to create more of a conversation for tonight, we're seeing a huge gender difference in success rates. So while we say the average rate is 27 years of age, we see a huge gender difference, okay? We see that females are uh, on average are able to leave their house and be independent on their own, take care of their own bills, take care of their, if they have children, take care of children on their own, uh, on average by the age of 21. Okay. Uh, for men, there's a different story. On average, the average male in the United States right now is incapable of living on their own independently until the age of 34. And then when we average those, that's where we get the age of 27 for, for everyone. Okay. So literally, when we look at variations, uh, females in our culture are able to live independently and support themselves between the age of 18 to 27. But it takes males on average or on variation from the age of about 27 to about the age of 39, okay? And we've often asked these questions and they're very important sociological questions. What are going on with men in our culture and within our society? Because not only uh, are we seeing men uh, failing, uh, getting independent on their own, we find that on, on average, males have lower high school graduation rates than their female counterparts. They have lower graduation from college rates, uh, compared to their female counterparts. More women now are going on and getting advanced degrees as compared to their male counterparts. Men are also starting to lose out in the income game and the employment gain as they're experiencing more over, uh, more turnover, more unemployment than their female counterparts. Yet in our culture, in our broader culture, we still live in a very patriarchal type of society. So I want to, because we're talking about gender and we're talking about these shifts that we're seeing sociologically, I do wanna play another video. Again, it's by the same people we listen, person we listened to last week, uh, Philip Zimbardo. And the, the, the video is uh, called The Demise of Guys. Um, and he goes over some very interesting data and trends that we're seeing with guys today that, frankly, we're not seeing with women, even though culturally and societally, uh, women still tend to be at a disadvantage, uh, even though they are being much more successful than their male counterpart. So I'm going to play this video. And then I would like to get everybody's opinion on it, or, or at least a, a majority of the class. And it's just a short uh, five minute. As I'm in the midst of applying for residency right now, wish me luck, Grammarly has again yeah. been a lifesaver with my application and helping me write my personal statement and CV. Grammarly is your digital writing. So today I want us to reflect on the demise of guys. Guys are flaming out academically, they're wiping out socially with girls and sexually with women. Other than that, there's not much of a problem. Uh, <laughs> so, so what's the data? So the data on dropping out is amazing. 
boys are more, 30% more likely than girls to drop out of school. Uh, in Canada, five boys drop out for every three girls. Girls outperform boys now at every level, from elementary school to graduate school. There's a 10% differential between uh, getting BAs and all graduate programs with guys uh, be falling behind girls. Two-thirds of all students in special ed, remedial programs are guys, and as you all know, boys are five times more likely than girls to be labeled as having attention deficit disorder and therefore we drug them with Ritalin. What's the evidence of, being, of wiping out? Uh, first, it's a, a new fear of intimacy. Intimacy means physical, emotional connection with somebody else uh, and especially with somebody of the opposite sex who gives off ambiguous, contradictory, phosphorescent signals. <laughs> And every year there's research done on self-reported shyness among college students and we're seeing a steady increase among males and this is two kinds. It's a social awkwardness. The old shyness was a fear of rejection. It's a social awkwardness like you're a stranger in a foreign land. They don't know what to say, they don't know what to do, especially one-on-one -on -one opposite sex. Um, they don't know the language of face contact, the nonverbal and verbal set of rules that enable you to comfortably talk to somebody else, listen to somebody else. There's something I, I'm developing here called social intensity syndrome, which tries to account for why guys really prefer male bonding over female mating. It turns out from earliest childhood, boys and then men prefer the company of guys, physical company. And there's actually a cortical arousal we're looking at because guys have been with guys in, in teams, in clubs, in gangs, in fraternities, especially in the military, uh, and then in pubs. And this peaks at Super Bowl Sunday when guys would rather be in a bar with strangers watching a totally overdressed Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers rather than Jennifer Lopez totally naked in their bedroom. The problem is they now prefer asynchronistic internet world to the spont spontaneous interaction in social relationships. Uh, what are the causes? Well, it's an unintended consequence. I think it's excessive internet use in general, excessive video gaming, excessive new uh, uh, access to pornography. The problem is these are arousal addictions. Drug addiction, you simply want more. Arousal addiction, you want different. Drugs, you want more of the same, different. So you need the novelty, you need the arousal, you need, you need to be sustained. And the problem is the industry is supplying it. Jane McGonigal told us last year that by the time a boy is 21, and he's played 10,000 hours of video games, most of that in isolation. As you remember, uh, Cindy Gallup said, boys don't know the difference between making love, men between making love and doing porn. The average boy now watches 50 porn video clips a week. And there's some guy watching 100, obviously. Uh, and the porn industry, <laughs> and the porn industry is the fastest growing industry in America, 15 billion annually. For every 400 movies made in Hollywood, there are 11,000 now made uh, porn, uh, porn uh, videos. So the effects very quickly is, it's a new kind of arousal. Boys' brains are being digitally rewired in a totally new way for change, novelty, excitement, and constant arousal. That means they're totally out of sync in traditional classes, which are analog, static, and interactively passive. They're also totally out of sync in romantic relationships, which build gradually and subtly. So what's the solution? It's not my job. I'm here to alarm. It's your job to come. <laughs> but, but, who should, but who should care? The only people who should care about this is uh, parents of boys and girls, educators, gamers, filmmakers, and women who would like a real man who they can talk to, who can dance, who can make love slowly, and contribute to the evolutionary pressures to keep our species above banana slugs. No offense to banana slug owners. Thank you. Okay, so that's just a kind of an introductory video about uh, what we're seeing as far as cultural and social shifts, especially here in the United States. And that, you know, he mentioned the preference for male bonding versus female bonding. And, and uh, there's actually been some really interesting research in the last few years where we've went and asked men, uh, what would you prefer, a weekend with your male buddies um, and having fun? Or would you prefer to be with your intimate partner um, uh, and, and have a romantic, loving weekend with an intimate partner? And greater than 75% of young men and men, middle-aged men, said that they would prefer 
to go be with their male friends than they would to spend a, a romantic intimate weekend with their intimate partner or girlfriend or, or spouse. And so here's the question that we have is, is we still live in a very male dominated society, but we're seeing some huge social changes. We're seeing women becoming more successful education wise, work wise, housing wise, and we're seeing females uh, uh, um, failing in a lot of these ways. And I, I indicated that by the age difference of dependence. So I'm kind of curious to hear from all of you based on what Zimbardo stated, based on what we've talked about with critical theory um, uh, and, and the like. What, what are your opinions about the social and cultural changes that we're seeing, even though we are are seeing very big, um, um, we, we still live in a very male oriented patriarchal society. What's everyone's thoughts about those issues? You can put them in the chat. I noticed that uh, Daniela put, um, um, thought it was funny and accurate or sad. Uh, she mentions American culture, maturity differences, um, and those kinds of things. Um, What's everyone else's thoughts? Well, where do we start? Uh, my God, what I've seen since my days, the changes. Uh, American culture, yes. Young American culture, definitely. Uh, sad, yes, very sad. Uh, I see men falling behind in basically everything, not only in education and financial opportunities and uh, reaching their goals. I think men are getting lazy and women are becoming more active, more aggressive. Uh, and women are starting to believe that they're worth more than what they have been valued in the past. And this is scary because to them, they have to crawl out of that hole, being housewife, being uh, under the control or let's say of somebody else, husband, boyfriend, society in general. Uh, women are having to crawl out of, out of that cave that will, they have more ambition. Men have been in the lead for centuries now. So their ambition is very little, they think, well, we're the champ. What do we have to worry about? Their eyes are closed. They're not watching what's going on behind their back. They're being overtaken by women and all the aspects of life. And uh, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, men are idiots. They screw everything up. Uh, women, I think, tend to be a little brighter, a little more thoughtful in decision-making to where men are kind of fly by go lucky kind of people so the change is good as far as i'm concerned uh don't know where it's going to take us or lead us to but it can't be any worse than what men have done so i'm not going to oppose it i go with the flow um other than that my opinion is basically that it's all good with me. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see a female becoming uh, stronger, smarter, better educated, uh, more independent. I guess what I'm looking for. They want to be more independent. And men are falling into the take care of me category. They want to be loved. They're more into the emotion aspect of life. Uh, Want to kick back, relax, be loved, be cared for. Uh, seems like men and women are changing places. When I understand both, I'm at the age where I want to be taken care of. I want to be loved. I want to be cared for. Uh, I'm not going to go out there riding around, but that's me. That's the age thing. Well, I'm going to be quiet. Let somebody else talk. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Frank.
Uh, how about someone else? Uh, David, I noticed you have your uh, mic on. Do you have a few words for us? Okay, yeah. Uh, basically, <clears throat> what I was thinking was like, he brought up some good points in that really society has changed, but attitudes really haven't yet, or at least like a lot of the majority. Like you'll see like a lot of people trying to roll back forcefully roll back modern society back to what it used to be and as you can clearly tell it's mostly it's mostly the people like old old republicans trying to do that and basically i feel like it back then it used to be <clears throat> men would just uh men used to have like a lot lower expectations because they pretty much already were in power and basically a majority like uh, only only a, a little only a small fraction of men actually decided to do the same thing like try to fall their way into power like other people did so a lot of them a lot of people were just content to lie back and basically enjoy having the most power and majority. So yeah, basically you used the men would, a man would just uh, do okay at school and then get a, get a general job and then marry, a, marry a woman that would basically just do everything for them. But now that women are now starting to get a more value or at least being valued pretty much the same as men now it's kind of caused a change where now you have a lot of people trying to pass down the values of trying to pass down their ideas that men should do one specific thing and women should do the other thing but now that there is such amount of pushback now the the people who are trying to raise people like that. Now the now the male children are basically being raised to not work as hard in a more competitive environment. And that causes them to basically, that causes a lot of the problems. <clears throat> and since they aren't expected to learn stuff, basic housekeeping stuff and other things like that, stuff that would normally be that would normally come from someone else, then they end up having to stay at home longer. They end up failing a lot more because they they have they don't have that crutch anymore. Meanwhile, women though meanwhile women are basically doing the now now it's more socially acceptable for women to actually do stuff. So people are taking advantage of that. And since they're putting in more work, then they're pretty much doing much better, especially when their competition isn't really trying to be competition. But yeah, basically it's kind of like, kind of like relating it to earlier, like feminist and uh, critical theory sort of like the internal misogyny that has been prevalent for so long is now actually hurting the people who are trying to, who are trying to acclimate to the modern world. Excellent, David, thank you for your input on that. Um, anyone else? I, I'm, I'm making some notes as we go along. Um, to kind of, I hope summarize, and I've been reading through the the uh, the uh, chats as well. Uh, anybody else want to kind of speak up and give their perspective? Because no one's right or wrong. So um, I think you're all meeting some important points that we need to talk about. So someone else. I definitely do feel that they're the maturity. Um, going back to prior, um, the maturity difference. Um, I worked at a junior high as a um, instructional aide and the maturity differences that I noticed, I was just like appalled. 
um, from the, the, you know, from the girls to the boys. And um, I don't know, I couldn't really identify like why, right? Why are these teenager, teenager boys not adequately mature enough or mature like the, the teenage girls? Um, and I see it a lot in my daughter. My daughter is 14. And she, I, she's very mature for her age, I believe. Um, and when I compare it to other kids, her own age, there it's just like night and day. Um, and I, I think that, you know, with the younger generation right now, that COVID did not help with any of that situation, even within like our own self right? Because we were forced to be isolated with no social interaction, no kind of, you know, that, that interaction that keeps us, you know, human, talking from one each other, you know, in person. Um, because again, it's like they missed two years of their whole life is just gone. They didn't get that social aspect of school. They had to, you know, see their teachers through a, or their classmates through a video screen, or they had to, you know, go onto the gaming to be able to talk to their friends. You know, it's, it's not like, Hey, back in when I was young, mom, I'm going outside. Okay. Be home when the lights come on. Right. Like now we're just so technology advanced. Like we're always, the kids are either always on the iPads doing something youtube video games watching tv um and they miss that huge chunk of learning making mistakes getting hurt um I, yeah so that that's kind of where i stand and it's you know with the women it's we've done this, you know, for years where we've stayed home, took care of, you know, the house chores, did all that by, you know, the European rule book of, you know, the housewife. Um, and now modern times is we can't really afford to stay home, right? Like, or we don't want to, like, why should we be the ones doing that, staying home, doing all of this. But we've also created that, um, I don't know, in, in that, like an imbalance on us, right? We want to do this, but then now we're doing all of the stuff that we were doing. Plus now that we've tossed work on top of it. So now that we're working, we are taking care of kids, making dinner, cooking, cleaning, doing all those other stuff. Now we toss work on top of it. So I don't know if it's our fault or if at that, the shift in the chore, the household chores doesn't get split down the middle. And it's, you know, causes friction in between relationships, between, you know, households. And I see it a lot of myself because I'm like, I created this. I have to, you know, and I'm like, okay, got to step back, let it go. You know, and it's, men are having to, you know, find their balance. Okay, yeah, they work, but women have been working, doing chores, wiping butts all day as well. So if we can do it, men should be able to do it too. And that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. I think you bring up a couple of points and I am making notes and I am watching the chat. I think I'm going to post our chat in our in our um, uh, canvas as well. So um, anyone else want to speak up verbally about these issues? I think there's, there's some great comments that have been made. I'm not going to give a speech. All right, then. Um, well, you know, um, I think 
you know, men, even young men, and I guess I'm kind of still young. Um, I think it's a uh, decision making, you know, just like day to day activity. It's true. Lots of men are into video games, and the technology has become so sophisticated with that it consumes all their time, and time is very valuable. Women don't have, from what I noticed, women don't have the same appeal to certain technologies as men do. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess even I heard someone say, you know, technology can be like a like a drug, you know, um, definitely a time distracting drug. So, you, know, you kind of look at a woman's interests and what they want, a man's interests and what they want. It's video games or movies or whatever they invest their time on on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I guess, like you say, you're seeing the balance shift in the sense. Yeah, um, don't know what to think about it. I mean, it definitely is just kind of a interesting phase of society right now. Um, hey, I guess life's unpredictable, anything can happen, but it does seem like it's the current state, so. I guess it's not, you know, for a guy, it's nothing to really be proud of, but I mean, I guess results are results, you know, you go into life, you see what you see. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Vince, and I, I appreciate those insights to the experience dealing with technology and all of those things, and, and uh, we'll talk about that as well. Um, any other comments? There's, I encourage everyone to uh, look through the, the discussion posts as well, the, the, the chat. Um, does anybody else have any else thing? <laughs> I can't talk all of a sudden. Does anyone else have any more to add to our verbal conversation in the chat? And then I'll hit on a few points that I think have been made. Clarissa? So, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, I would like to point out like how Darius said about, you know, a single parent household. Um, I would say like, for me personally, you know, I was raised by my mother and she knew how to do a lot of things that, you know, would be known for like a male type of role, like changing a tire or, um, you know, like chopping wood and stuff like that, or, you know, cleaning out our pipes and stuff, you know. <clears throat> I feel like, you know, things like that, um, females are getting more into basically learning how to, well, they already know how to do things on their own and stuff. And it's just more of like the emp empowerment of like getting out there and doing it basically. Um, showing that our younger generations, you know, that we as women need to stand up for our rights or stand up for what we believe in, even though, you know, it may be known or seen as like a male, um, I guess like, I don't know how I would explain it. I don't even know if I'm making sense, but I, I feel like, you know, I understand, you know, there is a lot of um, the differences between, you know, the male and female, and it also could be like, you know, um, the the boys don't have that that male figure there or a correct or a respectable male figure you know and it also could play a part in like where and how they were raised like if they were raised around people that want to do like gang stuff or things like that um then that's what they're going to grow up to be because that's what they were around of showing like the gang aspect of everything. <laughs> I don't know. So I'd like to add to um, some of that. So, I mean, if you think about it, 
the older generation and men are more used to women doing a lot of the work, kind of like their mom would. They would cook for them, they would clean for them, they would do laundry and all of those different things. But nowadays, women look for men to mature, basically. So like, um, my husband is younger than me. <laughs> so with that being said, you know, women out there in the dating world are legit looking for men that are finally out of college and are finally able to hold a stable job and things like that, which makes them older than the man. And they end up taking care of these younger men. So, and by the time, you know, they're of age, they end up getting a divorce, leaving children, and then the mother ends up taking care of the kids. And I was a single mother as well. So one thing that would bother me is a woman cannot raise a man. So, and with that, you know, all that coming into play, it just makes it really hard for the men to like actually get a grasp on what a man is supposed to be per se. Thank you, Shannon. I, and, and I think those are some points that we, we, we need to focus on. Yeah, so thank you for that. Molly, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I just kind of wanted to go off um, about the recent people. Um, I kind of agree with that because as um, a person who did come from a single parent home, I kind of didn't really like for me, uh, I don't really have like a good picture as a man because my mother raised both me and my brother for um, like a lot of like, I'm <laughs> sorry, for all their life. Like, yeah, we did have our dad at like some point, but he wasn't there. But both me and my brother, we like, we look up to her and she's done like amazing things. So for us, I feel like she would be kind of like the role model and she's like, doing everything she can to take care of us and to think about it like a lot of my aunties and like my family members we don't have like a lot of men in our family it's like mainly like strong women and I was just like seeing that difference because when I was younger I would see my uncles they would be doing good but then like as life went on I saw them go downhill then I noticed that a lot of my aunties and my cousins, they would all like do a lot more. But um, <laughs> that was about it. Sorry. I think what we've come to is a generation of women, strong women, raised by strong women who therefore have been raised by strong women. So now we've become these overly powerful creatures, right? Like we can do whatever it is that we want, right? There's no stopping us. We can be single parents. We can, you know, we can do all of these things on our own, which then, you know, we've created this like monster. <laughs> and now in this generation that we have, you know, there's men who don't know what to do they're they're lost they're like okay like is it good is it you know is it bad I don't know like I can't handle this because I I've lost that power I am no longer in control I need to be told what I need to do in order to maintain my place in this world and it's it's scary honestly because it's like when we, we, you know, the ideal, ideal world, right? You're supposed to be married, children, loving house, blue, white picket fence, red door. But when you become so powerful, how do you mentally prepare yourself to let go of that, right? Evil creates evil. So the 15 volts has now gone up to 100. And we don't know how to back off. We don't know how to let go of the reins and just be like, okay, I'm okay with not having control because once you have that control, you don't ever wanna let it go. And that's how I feel on some days where I'm just like, I gotta know everything, I gotta do everything. But in reality, I'm like, okay, no, I don't, I can't. There's no, there's no way I'm losing, I'm yelling, screaming, losing my mind, 
running late to everything, but I'm still in control, right? I still want to be in control. And I'm, I'm sure like if you're, you know, mom, you always have to be, and there's no letting go, but generational, like genocide, like healing, right? Is, is that's where it's coming from is that we have to be able to understand it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not always have to be in control of the situation, you know, all the time. And, you know, it's, it's being ideal for our kids. It's being the, you know, outspoken mom or the, you know, the overprotective mom so that our kids know that, hey, if, ever, if there's ever anything wrong, I always have mom or somebody to go to. But again, I'm always referring back to mom because mom's always there. So it's, it's, I feel like it's a vicious cycle that just gets in, you know, continuing and continuing. Um, my mom was a single parent. I, you know, my dad was in prison majority of my life. So when I think back, it, it was always my mom, my mom doing something. And a lot of my trauma, I guess, has come from that. And it took me a while to realize that she didn't have anybody either because her mom, my grandma died when my mom was eight in a car accident. So therefore, again, right? Like generations of like trauma, just trying to heal itself. And here we are. <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. Darius, I see that you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, um, is it Tanisha? Um, but like she said, like that having the urge to like let it go as a woman is hard because I was single mom for like five years. I do have two kids, but now I'm in this, well, semi new relationship. We've been together for a year and he's, I guess it would be like a healthier relationship. He wants to help, you know, he wants to take the load off. He's like the disciplinary, but as a mom and just having to do everything on my own before it's so hard for me to like let go of that control like you know like splitting up the household chores because I don't feel like it's gonna be done the right way like picking up the kids like it's so hard to let that little bit of I guess independent in, I wouldn't say independence but the help come in because it's like I've done it by myself for so long that I just know how to do it all you know, I know how to take care of my kids, work, go to school, like I can just handle it. But then there are days where it is stressful. And then I'm like, she said, uh, yelling around and losing my mind when I could just accept the help. So the accepting the help as a going from a single mom to someone to help you is also very difficult. And I'm currently experiencing that is like trying to let that go. And my mom was a single mom for a long time with seven of us. So I always seen her like, just do it and never ask for help. You know, she was always like, she said, moms are always there. So I feel like for my kids, I have to always be the one there for them. But realizing now that it's okay to have a dad involved, you know, it's okay for my son to go to the dad and get the male's perspective and not just like, why is he asking me? Why is he coming to me? Like letting go of that little bit of and I guess control is so hard as a woman now because I want to just do it on my own because I know I'll do it the right way. And I just wanted to make that point, like that part letting go is hardest because I've always seen my mom just do it. Don't ask for help. Don't ask, like, you know, just do it. And so now I feel like I should just do it. But here he is like, let me help you. Like, let me just take the stress off you. And I'm like, I have to let him take the stress off me because it does get overwhelming and stressful. But it's very hard to let that happen after so many years of just doing it myself. Thank you, Darius. I think those are very good uh, points that you're making about uh, not let, wanting to let go. Uh, and so I think that's really important. Is there anybody else that wants to add conversation before I summarize a few things? Well, you picked a really good topic here. I mean, we could go on forever, but that's not to. All right, Frank, I'll summarize. <laughs> One, I do want to encourage everybody to look at the chat and I, I'd especially look for, you know, 
a lot of topics we talk about in classes like this can be very difficult. And I do want everybody to know their support. So Danielle uh, did post a, the, the, the counseling resources here at TOCC for these types of conversations that we're having because they can be uh, pretty heavy for both women and men. Um, and also they are in our um, um, uh, Canvas website, if anyone wants to click on that, if, if anything is, is being brought up uh, from, uh, by someone. I want to just mention uh, a few things. One, we, we do need to recognize, and, and this is kind of, I feel, uh, you know, from my perspective as a social psychologist, the next evolution that needs to occur in, in kind of this, this movement towards women finding uh, who they are and their power that they have is that while we do see the success of women in our society and we know that they're outscoring men on almost every uh, matrix that we have, women in our culture because of our culture are still being exploited for that. So uh, even though women are more employable, women are, have higher educations and all of those things, they're still being exploited for that. I almost, um, I almost liken it to a sweatshop, even though it's not as extreme as, as those conditions. But if you think about what's going on culturally, the, 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 the power of women today is really still being exploited by our society. And I think that's something that we do need to address as we move forward is that inequality that still exists between a, a young man and a young woman, because, you know, a woman could be at a bachelor's level position, but still be making the same as a high school graduate male in our society. So I just want to point that out, that we still have work to do in bringing at least any type of equality in those senses from a cultural perspective. The other comment uh, that I'd like to make is going back to those sources of power, legitimate power versus cohesive power, okay? With any species that we look at, even when it comes down to lions and, and you know how male lions protect their thing and the like, we still see that the power within any species still lays with the female. And what I mean by that is the legitimate power, the species power, because the female is the species, is the partner that is the only one that can give birth, is the only one that can give life. Yes, men contribute. Don't, don't let me put that out there. But the woman is the only one that that child could develop and give birth to and be sustained by through the female's milk. Without women, species stop to exist unless you're a, I forget what kind of species it is where you split in two and then they become two separate things. But for most species, without the female, we simply stop to exist. And so legitimate power within any society really lays with females. Now, later in the semester, I'll get more detail about this, but there's something called um, terror threat theory, okay? And what terror threat theory, it isn't about terrorism. Terror threat theory is when someone feels that they are be their group is being threatened, that their authority and power is being threatened, that they will aggress against outgroups. And when we put gender on a binary, that, that we feel that there's only men and that there's only women, which again, we'll get into this argument later in the semester, what is the outgroup to the legitimate power of women? Well, the outgroup to legitimate power of women is men. Okay, and so how do men over the centuries taken power over and taken power to control. They've done it through coercive power. We've done it through religion. We've done it through government. We've done it through establishment of the family system. We've done it through ritual. We've done it through saying, you can't climb this mountain, 
but I can type of ideals. Okay. So when we look at the power between females and males, one, we have to realize that a lot of the conflicts for especially males today comes from the realization that women are realizing their legitimate power. Okay. And what's being not known is that we, a lot of times we don't know the source of our power. And all that men are left there going is, wait a minute, I'm the one that's supposed to be in control. I'm the one that's supposed to dictate what the family looks like. I'm the one who is supposed to do this and that and this. But we're finding that as women find their legitimate power in, in, in our cultures, that that's leaving men kind of, kind of in the dust as been recommended. So we need to recognize when it comes to these gender issues that there's legitimate power based on biology and based on species. And then there's cohesive power that is based on culture and society. Okay, and sometimes those conflict with each other, which today has resulted with a lot of confusion for men because our predominant culture says we're the ones that are supposed to be in control but we're experiencing a loss of control, okay? Uh, I did want to just focus a little bit on the maturity differences between men and women. Traditionally, what we have seen, and, and again, this comes from research going back almost 70 years ago. Well, actually, no, we're, I always think about this if we're in the year 2000. So this 70 plus 22 years, so we're talking 80, 90 years, okay? I always think back and time things by the year 2000. I don't know why. Um, that uh, when we saw maturity, we saw maturity differences wiped out by the age of uh, 21, 22. Meaning what I mean by that is the scholastic uh, advantages women had. The athletic paralysis men have the reading ability, mathematical ability, that, that there tended to be huge gender differences through childhood tend to wash away at about the age of 21, 22. But we're actually finding that there's differences in this as we, we develop, that, 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 that standard that has been set, that there are differences between male and females on intellectual measures, all of those we're starting to see a separation of those things, okay? Um, and on that, there's something that I, I do wanna bring up uh, from, from uh, child uh, development and, and whatnot and um, looking at that, I mentioned maturity. And, and we do need to recognize that there's a difference between psychological maturity and sexual maturity. Sexual maturity is defined by the time by that puberty mark. Okay, so for one thing we need to understand is puberty is actually a three to four year process, but we mark it by the age of the female's first menstruation. We know less about male uh, point of puberty because a male puberty is set at the first time a male ejaculates by the fantasy of a female or, or who they're sexually attracted to. And so you can see that, uh, that, that uh, the, the, the study of male puberty is a little bit more difficult because not many men, well, men will either lie about it or they won't be willing to put it on paper about what age. But we do see from some research that there's trends Psychological maturity is defined by this paradigm. You go to a store and you have $50 in your wallet. You're not going to get paid until next Friday. Okay. But let's say you go to the store on a Friday, you have $50 on Monday, your electric bill is due and it is also $50. Okay. And this is one of the simple ways we measure psychological maturity, okay, is what we find is that the immature mind 
will say, let's say, that, so you go to the store and there's a shirt you really want and it costs $50, okay? So you know you have a bill on Monday and here we are on Friday, but we don't get paid till next fr until next Saturday. Let's make the day a little bit different, okay? The psychologically immature mind will buy this t-shirt and say, I'll figure out my power bill on Monday. The psychologically mature mind will say, you know what? I cannot buy that shirt. I have a power bill due on Monday. I'll come back next Saturday on payday and see if the shirt is still on sale. So you kind of can see the difference between that psychological maturity. One, you're withholding instant gratification to take responsibility for your survival. In the other, you're going for instant gratification and choosing this and saying, well, I'll just figure out the rest later. And we ask, and this is the simplest example of this. I'm just giving the simple example. And so when we ask people, what would you do? Okay. Again, on average, we see this getting older and older and older. So back if we ask this question back in the 1960s, 1970s, it was the age of 16, people would withhold that gratification. Getting into the 70s and 80s, it was 18. Getting into the 1990s, it was 21, 1921. Getting into today, and it's interesting because it has to do with that maturation we talked about earlier about being independent. The average age of psychological maturation is the age of 28. Okay, where, where individuals can withhold that gratification for, for, for to take care of their survival responsibilities. So we've seen that get older and older and older. But we've seen physical sex, sexual maturation getting younger and younger and younger. So again, we go back to the 50s, 60s. The average age was 14, 16. We get into the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We're getting down to 12 to 13. We get into the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. The age is getting down to 11. And we're getting to the point where, where sexual maturation is occurring around the age of 9 to 10 on average, with some children sexually going through their first uh, menstruation at the age of 5, okay? And I will tell you, um, um, uh, the youngest sexual abuse victim that was pregnant that gave birth uh, for in, in, in the work I did, she was at the age of nine. She was impregnated by her dad at the age of eight. Um, and so we're seeing this gap between physical maturation into adulthood and psychological maturation. And this gap is getting wider and wider and wider. Now, how does this relate to gender? While we know that women, even when they're maturing sexually earlier, come to a better understanding of their responsibilities to life, that if they get pregnant, especially with today with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, they are going to be a mother. They are going to be responsible for a child they are going to be responsible for their environment on the, on the overall part. Men, on the other hand, are excused from that responsibility. Indeed, um, uh, there was a re recent survey among men about pro-abortion versus uh, anti-abortion uh, laws. And it was almost kind of scary because... Uh, a good majority of men said that they were pro-abortion because they didn't want to get stuck with the potential of child support. Not because of the moral reasons that you would assume, but because of that obligation feeling that they would have. Because if it's an unlegitimate child, then the legal system is eventually going to stick me with child support, okay? So we see this constant kind of relief of what you would consider duties and responsibilities from the family and the social system, okay? 
And so that contributes to a lot. A lot of individuals in the chat mentioned the difference in maturity level, where today young women are forced to maturate much quicker than most men. Okay. Um, uh, we can talk about the technology thing that was brought up a lot. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the things that we need to understand is, is what we do on the internet will determine what the internet gives us. Okay. And uh, everything from Google to TikTok to Facebook to uh, all of the other medias are based on a logarithms. And those logarithms are meant to get you to that social media as soon as possible and quickly as possible and as much as possible. So it's a logarithm is meant to make sure that when you turn on your Facebook, when you turn on your TikTok, when you Google, it's going to give the content that you want, not what you need. And when we see this sensation building society, we do see that for the mass majority, when you're looking for instant gratification and escape, your Google, your Facebook, your TikTok will deliver those things for you, but it's not going to provide you with what you need, just what you want. And so technology, we have to understand technology. We're run, almost running out of time. And so uh, let's see, uh, lack of fatherhood was brought up. Um, I will, get, let me do this. I'm going to summarize a lot more of this next Monday because we're getting pretty late for tonight. Um, there was one point that I wanted to make. Let's see, expected power and control. Um, one of the things that I did want to focus on a, a little bit today, and we'll end with this tonight, is the issue, uh, it, I think it was brought up uh, from Tashina about power and about single parenting and stuff. And, and once a, a woman wants that, it's hard to give that up. That goes across genders, that goes across race, and we have to understand that. But when we look at socialization of young men and young women, and this uh, was an important point that was brought up that a lot of the women mentioned, well, I don't know how to raise a boy. And, and that's an important aspect. But uh, when we look at the passage of cultural norms, not those overt ones that says, you know, uh, men should do certain things during a ceremony and men should do, you know, these games and women should do these, not those. I'm talking about those other ones about the responsibility of men and women in a culture. That, according to research, is transmitted more through the mother than it is the father. And so those patriarchal norms that men are inheriting are likely to be handed to them by that single mother who also doesn't know also how to develop that young man into a young man. And I'll end with this example. Um, if this, again, was a developmental class and we went to a weirdo researcher named Sigmund Freud, he came up with a, a, a developmental phase called the phallic phase of development. It, it ranges from about the age of five to seven. And it come, it, it, it's where Freud's theory gets really weird, but I want to explain it. It's where Freud says a, a boy wants to have sexual relationships with his mother and get away from his father. And the way that the boy does that, he is emulates the father and what the father does in that role in order to gain, according to Freud, sexual relationships with mom. Later on, Jung added the Electra complex uh, for women who are want to gain access to their father because they recognize their father has something that they don't called a penis. And so they go through something called penis envy. So they uh, emulate their mother and their mother's role to gain access to the father. I mean, that's the weird version of that. Uh, but what is actually going on between the age of four and six? And that is role playing. Children during this age role play everything. They role play mom's role, father's role, Superman's role, their teacher's role. 
their neighbors roll some, they, they role play during play. And what are they doing during this time, uh, at least more research wise, what are they doing this time? They're developing an understanding of how to interact with the world. They're taking what they like from their interactions and they're putting it as part of their personality and they're throwing out what they don't like, okay? And so what was Freud actually getting to is something that we've actually seen in research. Since we've had children raised with single parents for a long time, we can see the effects. And so I wanna to speak to two single parent groups. Single mothers who deny access their son to a legitimate role, um, uh, role, uh, same sex role, uh, person. So this could be uh, her her boy, uh, a good boyfriend, uh, a new stepdad, a grandfather, a good uncle. They deny the son from having positive male role models in their life, and we can also study men who isolate their daughters from having access to positive female role mates. And usually it has to do with their experience with men and women and whatnot. And, and that's not what our debate is. What our debate is, is then what happens to these children when they become adults. And we find in both roles, the women who deny their young boys positive role, model, role models, male role models during this age group, and female and males who deny their daughters positive female roles during this period is we find that they tend to have relationship difficulties as adults. They tend to have the highest divorce rate, the highest failure rate in relationships. They are more likely to get into toxic relationships and all of those things. And it goes back to a point that was made in that video and that was made in here is that if we don't provide individuals with that positive same-sex role model, this tends to have negative consequences in the future for many, for those children, okay? And you've all alluded to this idea of uh, a lot of boys being raised in fatherless homes. We, you brought this up with uh, the, the, the description of many of the women in the room saying, I knew how to raise my daughter, I knew that, but I didn't have a good grasp of raising my young boy. And so I want to leave you with that idea, both on the uh, global social level, level, dealing with legitimate versus coercive power, the ideas of technology and the idea of the way that we're capable and able to raise our children in the society and providing them with those positive role models that we should be providing them with. Okay, I will get to, I actually wrote down 12 different points from you all. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize those, but I think we should call it a night. I'm seeing some tired faces on the video and it has been a long class. So I will continue this conversation in the first part of next class and we will go from there. So everyone go have a wonderful evening. Enjoy a little bit of time with your family and kids and friends, and we will see you uh, next Tuesday. Very good class. Thank you so much, you guys. And therefore, the first guy's name was.